You know, it's funny how often you hear narcissists thrown around these days. It's like almost anyone who's a little too into themselves gets slapped with that label. Yeah, it's become this like buzzword. Exactly. But it's so much deeper than just someone who like loves taking selfies, right? Right. You sent over some seriously fascinating research on this and I'm ready to unpack it all. So consider this a deep dive into what narcissism really is, how to spot it, and how to deal with it in relationships. I think what gets lost in all the noise is how different narcissism is from simply loving yourself. It's not just vanity, it's this whole pattern, this way of seeing yourself as superior and then treating other people accordingly. Like their self-image is this super fragile thing that they have to protect at all costs and everyone else is just a pawn in that game. Exactly. And the research you shared makes it clear that we're talking about a spectrum here. A little bit of narcissism, pretty common, even healthy sometimes, you know? Oh, absolutely. But when it takes over and starts affecting your relationships, that's where things get interesting. Okay, so before we get into the heavy stuff, let's define what we're actually dealing with here. Well, at its core, narcissism is this excessive self-focus that often comes at the expense of others. These are people who need to be admired, they need to be the center of attention. And empathy? Not so much. Not their strong suit, no. So it's not just vanity, it's this total lack of consideration for how their actions affect other people. It's like other people's... Feelings just don't even register. Well, that's the thing about empathy, right? With narcissism, it's not always that they can't understand how someone else is feeling. It's that those feelings just don't matter if they don't align with their own needs. Now, the articles you sent mention different types of narcissism, right? Grandiose versus vulnerable. Those seem pretty distinct. Yeah, they are. Okay, so <laughs> picture a grandiose narcissist at a party, right? They're dominating every conversation, interrupting, name dropping like crazy. They leave for that spotlight. Oh, I know the type. Probably have some perfectly rehearsed story about a chance encounter with someone famous. Exactly. Now, a vulnerable narcissist might be at that same party, but they're kind of lurking on the edges. Maybe putting on this air of self-deprecation, but secretly fishing for compliments the whole time. Oh, so they're more likely to pull you aside after someone compliments them and be like, oh, it was nothing, really. Exactly. Two sides of the same coin, you see. Both driven by that same underlying need for admiration, but they play it out in totally different ways. This is already shedding so much light on why that narcissist label gets tossed around so casually. It's way more complex than people realize. But let's say you're listening to this and thinking, okay, this sounds a little too familiar. How do you know if it's actually narcissism or just a few quirks? Well, the research highlights a few pretty clear signs to look out for. Constant entitlement, like they're above the rules. Mm -hmm. Manipulation, even if it starts subtly, you know. Oh, yeah. That charm offensive can be dangerous. Exactly. And, of course, that relentless need for admiration we've been talking about. And I'm guessing that when that admiration isn't flowing freely, that's when things go south. Exactly. You might see arrogance belittling others, anything to reassert their sense of superiority. It's all a defense mechanism to protect that fragile ego. So it's less about them being intentionally malicious and more about frantically trying to maintain this image they have of themselves, no matter who gets trampled in the process. Precisely. Hmm. And because empathy is often lacking, they just don't get how their behavior impacts other people. They see the world entirely through the lens of their own needs. It's a very self-centered existence. Okay, so we've got a pretty good handle on what narcissism is, how to spot it. But where does that leave the people who are in a relationship with the narcissist? Because from what I've read, it can get pretty intense. Oh, it can get very intense. One of the most damaging patterns you see in these relationships is the cycle of idealization and devaluation. Okay, let's unpack that one because that comes up a lot in what you share. Okay, so imagine you meet someone and they are completely smitten with you, like over the top, showering you with attention, compliments, making you feel like you are the most fascinating person on the planet. You've been completely swept off your feet. Right. But that, my friend, is the idealization phase. Yeah. And it's often very, very short-lived. Oh, no. So as soon as you do something, anything, that doesn't perfectly align with their expectations. Or you assert your own needs. Forget it. That's when the devaluation begins. So it's all downhill from there. Well, more like a roller coaster ride. Oh, no. Suddenly, that same person who couldn't get enough of you is criticizing you, withdrawing affection, maybe even giving you the silent treatment. Wow, that's brutal. It's like emotional whiplash. It can be incredibly damaging to your self-esteem. You start to question your own worth. 
And the research mentioned how this can really spiral for the partner of a narcissist. We're talking anxiety, depression, even physical symptoms from all the stress. Absolutely, because they end up walking on eggshells all the time, hyper aware of everything they say or do, just trying to avoid triggering another one of those devaluation episodes. It's exhausting. Me. Has anyone listening ever felt that firsthand, that need to constantly tiptoe around someone's ego? I'm not asking for personal stories or anything. Right. But it's something to reflect on as we go deeper with this. Because knowing the signs is one thing, but actually navigating these relationships, that's a whole other beast. It's one thing to recognize the signs, you know, like we were just talking about. Right. But figuring out what to actually do do about it, how to deal with those narcissistic tendencies, that's where it gets really tricky. Especially when we're talking about something as serious as narcissistic personality disorder. NPD. Exactly. NPD, that's not just someone who's a little self-centered, right? Yeah. This is a whole different ball game. Right. NPD is not just a handful of traits. It's like the foundation of their personality is different. You know? Okay, so someone with NPD isn't just having a bad day or being selfish in the moment. It's like their default setting is out of whack. Exactly. And that's where the DSM-5 criteria come yeah. in, right? That's how professionals actually diagnose NPD. And just for anyone who's not familiar, that's like the official diagnostic manual. Exactly. And it's a whole pattern of things. But at its core, it's that grandiosity, the need for admiration, and then just this real lack of empathy. And that can play out in so many different ways. Well, let's dive into this a little bit more because you mentioned earlier, even understanding the why behind the behavior, why someone might be acting this way, it doesn't excuse it. No, it doesn't. See, with NPD, you often see this really inflated sense of self-importance. Mm. And it's not just confidence, it's this belief that they are superior, they're special, they deserve special treatment. Even when there's absolutely no evidence to support that. Zero evidence. It's like that person at work who takes credit for everyone else's ideas, but God forbid you ever criticize them. Oh yeah, that's a classic example. Mm -hmm. And it's often tied to this insatiable need for admiration, which, you know, we keep coming back to that. They need that constant validation to prop up this image they have of themselves. And when they're not getting it, watch out. It's like they short circuit. They might lash out, withdraw, become even more manipulative to try to regain control and feel important again. Which I guess explains why the empathy is so often lacking. Because if you're that wrapped up in your own needs and your own ego, other people's feelings just become irrelevant. Totally. Their world is very, very self-focused. So let's say you're listening to this and you're in a relationship with someone who has NPD. What do you do? It's a tough spot to be in, that's for sure. Yeah. And that's where the research you provided offers some really, really helpful guidance. But I think even before we get into the how to, the what do I do, we need to start with this. It is not your job to fix them. That's huge because I think so often people get stuck in this cycle of trying to change the narcissist, trying to reason with them to make them see how hurtful their behavior is. Totally understandable. Right. But the thing is, you can't force someone with NPD to change. Mm. The desire, it has to come from within. And even then, it's a long, difficult road. So what can you do? Because it sounds like what you're saying is giving up all hope is not the answer either. No, no, not at all. I think knowledge is power in these situations, right? The more you understand about NPD, the better equipped you are to navigate the relationship in a way that protects yourself. Okay, so where do you even begin? Where do you draw the line when someone's behavior is so outside the norm? Boundaries. Mm -hmm. That is the key word. And it starts with identifying what you are and are not willing to tolerate. Like, what are your absolute deal breakers in a relationship? Exactly. And those are going to be different for everybody. Totally. But once you've figured out what your boundaries are, you have to communicate them clearly and directly. Don't beat around the bush. And I'm guessing be prepared for pushback. Oh, absolutely. People with NPD are not known for taking no for an answer. They might try to guilt trip you, manipulate you, minimize your feelings. So how do you stand your ground when someone is so skilled at twisting things around? It takes practice, honestly. And sometimes it requires professional support to help you build that inner strength, you know, and learn how to assert yourself effectively. So therapy, counseling, that kind of thing can be helpful not just for the person with NPD, but for the people who love them as well. Absolutely. It can be so invaluable for 
processing your own emotions, developing coping mechanisms, and like we were saying, learning how to navigate those really difficult conversations. Because let's be real, even if you intellectually understand what's going on, it doesn't make the experience any less painful to deal with. No. Not at all. And that's why self-care is absolutely crucial in these situations. Okay, so what does that look like? Self-care, when you're in a relationship with someone who has NPD, it sounds almost impossible to prioritize your own needs when you're constantly walking on eggshells. It is really challenging. There's no doubt about it. It's not about being selfish or abandoning the other person. It's about recognizing that you can't pour from an empty cup. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, you can't be a source of support for someone else if you're completely depleted yourself. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's about replenishing your own energy, setting those boundaries to prevent further drain, and then seeking support from people who understand what you're going through. Okay, so finding a therapist, a support group, confiding in trusted friends and family, it's about building your own safety net outside of that relationship. Exactly. And self-care also involves, you know, doing things you enjoy. Reconnect with yourself. Right. Like taking that art class you've been thinking about or going for walks in nature, spending time with people who make you feel good. Yes. Yes, exactly. It's about remembering that you are worthy of love and respect and happiness, regardless of what's going on in that relationship. This is all so helpful, but I have to ask, what about treatment for NPD itself? Because you mentioned it earlier, the articles you sent mentioned it, but it doesn't sound like there's an easy fix. There's not. Yeah. NPD is notoriously difficult to treat. Yeah. And it's mainly because it requires the individual to acknowledge that they have a problem in the first place, which for someone with that inflated sense of self can be a huge hurdle to overcome. So it's not as simple as just taking a pill and hoping for the best. No magic pill for this one, unfortunately. Therapy is really the cornerstone of NPD treatment. Okay. And even then, success really depends on a lot of factors. The individual's motivation is huge. Like, are they truly committed to change? Or are they just there to appease someone else? Right. Like, if they're being dragged to therapy kicking and screaming, it's probably not going to go very well. Exactly. And then the therapeutic relationship itself is crucial. Finding a therapist who specializes in personality disorders, who they feel comfortable with, who they can build trust with, essential. So it's about finding the right fit, just like any other relationship. It is. It is. And just like in any relationship, it takes work from both sides, right? The therapist provides the guidance, the support, a safe space to explore those really deep-seated patterns. But the real work happens between sessions. So it's not a passive process. The therapist doesn't just wave a magic wand. Not at all. Yeah. It requires the individual to be actively engaged, to self-reflect, to challenge their own thoughts and behaviors, and honestly, be willing to sit with discomfort as they start to kind of unravel those deeply ingrained patterns. And that's where those different types of therapy you mentioned earlier come in, right? Like CBT, psychodynamic therapy, stima therapy. Yeah. They all offer like different approaches to tackling those ingrained patterns. Exactly. So CBT, for example, for focuses on identifying and changing those negative thought patterns and behaviors that are contributing to those narcissistic traits. So instead of spiraling into defensiveness or anger when their ego is threatened, they learn to like pause, reflect, and respond in a more constructive way. Exactly. Got it. Now, psychodynamic therapy, that one goes a little deeper, right? It delves into the unconscious mind, exploring how past experiences, especially from childhood, might be influencing those narcissistic patterns. Yeah. So it's about uncovering those early wounds that might be driving that need for constant validation and that fragile sense of self. Precisely. And then you've got schema therapy, which kind of combines elements of both CBT and psychodynamic therapy. And that one focuses on these maladaptive patterns or schemas that develop early on in life and then just continue to affect how we see the world and how we interact with others. So in the case of someone with NPD, those schemas might revolve around like a fear of inadequacy, a need for control, maybe a belief that they're not worthy of love unless they're constantly being admired. You got it. Schema therapy helps people become aware of these patterns and develop healthier ways of relating to themselves and others. This is fascinating stuff. I know from the research that medication isn't typically a primary treatment for NPD, but are there ever instances where it's used as part of the process? Yeah, that's a good question. And while medication can't cure NPD, it can be really helpful in managing co-occurring conditions that often pop up alongside the disorder. So we're talking anxiety, depression, maybe even substance abuse issues that can come from the stress of living with NPD and all the interpersonal problems that it causes. Exactly. So in those cases, a doctor might prescribe 
you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, or other medications to target those specific symptoms and just make the whole therapeutic process a little bit easier to manage. And it's got to be said, any decision about medication should always be made in consultation with a qualified medical professional. Absolutely. Okay. Self-treating can be so dangerous. A doctor can properly diagnose what's going on, monitor your progress, and make sure you're getting the right treatment. Now, for those listening who are in the thick of it, right, they're dealing with a loved one's MPD. It's easy to feel hopeless. It is. But from what I've read, treatment can be successful. It can. It's not a quick fix. It takes a lot of work, and I mean a lot of work yeah. from everyone involved. Right. But people with NPD can learn to manage their traits and build healthier relationships. So there's a glimmer of hope. It's like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but man, that tunnel can be dark. We've talked a lot about what NPD looks like from the outside, but what about from the inside? What motivates someone with this disorder to actually seek help and do the work? That's the million dollar question. And you're right, it often takes hitting some kind of rock bottom, you know, yeah. some major wake up call for them to even realize something needs to change. So are we talking like relationships blowing up, career crises, maybe even health problems from all the stress? All the above. Yeah. It's when the consequences of their behavior become impossible to ignore that they start to question, hey, maybe I'm the problem here. And even then, it's tough because their instinct is usually to deflect blame, right? Find someone else to point the finger at rather than look inward. Oh, absolutely. That's why having a solid support system is so, so important, even if it's just one or two people who can hold up that mirror oh. you know, gently but firmly and say, hey, maybe this is something you need to take a look at. It's like they need someone to cut through the noise of all those ego defenses and be like, hey, see that bigger picture over there? Yeah, you're affecting it. Exactly, exactly. And that's another reason why therapy can be so essential. A skilled therapist can help connect those dots, help them see those patterns in their behavior and how it's impacting their life. So it's not about fixing them, it's about guiding them toward that self-awareness. Exactly, exactly. And that can be a really, really long and painful process because it forces them to confront those deep-seated insecurities, those fears, all that stuff that fuels those defenses in the first place. It's like peeling back the layers of an onion. It is. It really is. It's going to make you cry. Right. But it can also be incredibly liberating. Liberating. That's a good word for it. Because at the end of the day, people with NPD are often just as unhappy, if not more so, than the people around them. Yeah, I'd agree with that. They might project this image of, like, total confidence and self-importance, but underneath, often, it's just this deep well of insecurity, this fear of being seen as anything less than perfect. Which is kind of heartbreaking when you think about it, because yeah. all that striving, all that manipulation, it's often coming from this really desperate place. Absolutely. And this need to fill a void they might not even be aware of. And that's what makes this whole topic so fascinating, don't you think? It's easy to judge, right? Yeah. Just slap a label on someone, call them a narcissist, and write them off. Yeah. But I think if there's one thing to take away from all of this, from all the research you sent, it's the importance of empathy. And not just empathy for the people on the receiving end of that narcissistic behavior, right? but empathy for the narcissist themselves. Exactly. Because when we can tap into that understanding, when we can see that their behavior is often a defense mechanism, a way of coping with pain, it doesn't excuse their actions. Right. But it does allow us to approach the situation with a little more compassion. It's like that saying, hurt people, hurt people. Yes. It doesn't make it right, but it kind of explains why there's often so much pain left in their wake. It does. It helps reframe it. So where does this leave us? What's the final thought you want to leave our listeners with about navigating this whole complex world of narcissism? You know, if you find yourself in a relationship with someone who exhibits narcissistic traits, just remember, you're not alone. Educate yourself, set those healthy boundaries we talked about, and prioritize your own well-being. And if you're the one struggling with NPD, know that there's hope. Help is available. It might not be easy, but it is possible to create a more fulfilling, more meaningful life for yourself and the people around you. Beautifully said. A huge thank you to you for diving into this with me. And all of you listening, thank you for sending in these sources and trusting us to take this deep dive with you. Remember, knowledge is power. Understanding these complex dynamics, it's the first step toward navigating them with more awareness and, yes, even compassion. Until next time.